All right, grab a Bible and find Galatians chapter 4 and verse 12. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 12. And uh, while you find that, let me just tell you that uh, when we planted salt and light, this mic cord's getting on me, sorry. Uh, when we planted salt and light, we were totally green. When I say we were green, I mean we were green. We knew nothing, okay? It was just me and my wife praying and saying, Lord, what do you want us to do? And we felt the Lord calling us to plant a church. And uh, someone along the way tells us about a 501c3. It's a tax exemption status. Uh, and they said, you need to get your 501c3. And I said, I don't know what that is. And they said, well, you need to look it up. And so I tried to look it up and a lot of confusing things happening. A lot of people saying things about this 501c3 and some people saying that you got to have it and other people saying, well, the church is automatically exempt and you don't have to have it. And, and I wasn't really certain what to do. And so I went to my pastor and I said to my pastor, I said, uh, hey, somebody's brought up to me about this 501c3. You know, we're trying to plant the church and, and I don't know what to do about it. And he kind of wrote me off. He said, Justin, I, I don't know anything about a 501c3. You know, I never planted a church. I, I was absorbed into this church. You know, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't plant, so I, I don't know. I was like, well... That wasn't very helpful. So I, I went home and I did a little research and I had all these papers that I printed about the different you know, sides, whether you should get one or not get one if you're a church and how you should handle that. And so I went back to the pastor with all this info and I said, it was like a week later, maybe a week and a half later, I said, hey, I've got all this info about 501c3. And, and he said, Justin, I, I told you I, I really don't know anything about it. I said, well, your wife's an accountant. Maybe, maybe you could just talk to her about it and see if she knows anything about a 501c3. And I left it there and I went back a third week. And when I went back a third week, I had some papers with me. And I said, uh, hey, I want to bring up to you about that 501c3. And he put his hand up at me and he said, Justin, I don't wake up in the morning thinking about 501c3. And I was kind of taken back. I was, I was just trying to ask for help. And he just kind of, I mean, he literally stuck his hand up at me and, and stopped me. I, I was so angry that I went home and I told my wife, I'm not going back. Like in my mind, this was my perception. I have served this guy for seven years. I have been in this church. I've been a youth pastor. We had our we had our largest number of baptisms the year that, that I was youth second year I was youth pastor. We'd been there for seven years. Every year we'd had more than ten or eleven kids get baptized. One year we had nineteen kids get baptized, and, and you know he'd go on vacations, and and I would fill in for him. And I was so angry. I thought, how dare he treat me like that? All I wanted to know was about a five hundred one c three. You couldn't even ask your wife. And Sarah said to me, because she's always wiser than me, she said, Justin, uh, she said, we are, we are talking about the same pastor that when we were financially hurting that he paid for us to have an anniversary dinner, right? And I said, uh, probably a little more angry. I said, yeah, that's the guy. And she said, we are talking about the, the pastor that used to call us over to his house on a Friday night, and, and after I would go to seminary all week, he would... He would sit you down and he would write down with you and he would help you to, to learn how to actually write sermons. At class, not a, there's not a whole lot of good, good sermon writing good happen in seminary. I'm just telling you. <laughs> anyway, so he would sit me down and he would just one-on-one -on -one teach me how to write sermons. And she said, we're talking about that guy, right? And Yeah, we're talking about that guy. And then she brought up a third one. I had a friend, a buddy of mine, he... Uh, he also was in seminary, and his dad was the pastor of his church. And uh, when he we were graduating at the same time, and we were both trying to, you know, write your resume or do whatever you do when you get out of seminary. And, and uh, his his resume, he'd been able to preach less than ten times. His dad was the pastor; he'd only been able to preach ten times. And my resume, I, I'd been able to preach about time in seminary. The pastor had given me the pulpit over fifty times. Let me preach. And she said, we're, we're talking about the same guy, right? Isn't it kind of our natural tendency to do that? Like somebody can be there for you and help you, and they're, they are, they're there for you. They're your backup. And they support you, and, they, and they're there all the time, and then they do something wrong. I'm not, I'm not justifying. He shouldn't have snipped at me. I mean, I was, I was a, I'm, you know, in my early 20s trying to figure out about tax exemption status in a church. I didn't know. I'm not saying you should have snipped at me, but what I am saying is that we have this tendency that the moment something doesn't go our way, we kind of turn on the people that have been there for us. 
And that's what Paul is dealing with. You guys have been here for these sermons. You know what Galatians, what's happening in Galatians. Paul has been there for the churches of Galatia. And now that there's these Judaizers saying these other things that they should be following the law, when Paul is trying to tell them the truth, they're turning their backs on Paul. And that's what he's bringing up today. That's what Paul's doing today. He's bringing up, wasn't I there for you before? Weren't you there for me before? Didn't we love each other before? How did we get to this point where now, all of a sudden, I'm the enemy, I'm your enemy? And when we read this, I think we're going to see a lot of practical application about ourselves and how we ought to be leading in the church. Let's, let's look at Galatians chapter 4 and verse 12. Did I give you enough time to find it? All right, Galatians 4 and verse 12. Brethren, I urge you to become like me. For I became like you. And you've not injured me at all. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you've received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was your blessing you and what then was the blessing you enjoyed? For you for I bear witness. For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you that they may be that, that you may be zealous for them. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always and not only when I am present with you. My little children for whom I labor and birth again until Christ is formed in you. I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have my doubts about you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him about his word. Heavenly Father, Father, every, every week I'm amazed that you would allow me to get up and speak your word. Father, I, I have no wisdom of my own. And, and we in this room, Father, what wisdom do we have about your infinite word? Father, how can, how can I teach and how can they receive, how can I receive from your infinite word aside from your spirit? So God, we beg you, we petition you in the name of Jesus that your spirit would, would speak to our hearts, that your word would get a hold of us. You promise us, Father, that your word is a double-edged sword. And it will divide asunder even bone and marrow and soul and spirit. Father, I pray that you would divide us from those things that are hindering us in knowing your word. I pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Your word says if we who are evil know how to give good gifts, how much more will you give us the spirit if we ask? Father, we are asking that your spirit would be moving in this place, that your word would come alive to us and that we would see your word with fresh eyes. And Father, I pray that we would not just see your word and leave this place the same that we would hear from you, hear from your word, and, Father, that we would leave this place charged and on fire for you, even those who may not know you. Father, I pray that those who don't know you, I pray that they would come to know you, even this morning, through the preaching of your word, that your Holy Spirit would speak and that your word would move in our hearts. Father, we just pray that we'd be able to hide your word in our hearts. Father, that we'd see how it applies to our lives. I can't do that. I can't receive it. Father, only you can. And so we seek you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, look, it's verse 12. Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. At first, the this, this statement almost sounds a little bit conceited, doesn't it? I mean, Paul just told this group of people, I'm urging you to become like me. Remember that Paul is dealing with the churches of Galatia. And there's this other group of people that have kind of come in and they're trying to, they're trying to subvert the church. They're trying to, to get the church to go a different way than what Paul had taught. Paul had already taught them once that salvation was by faith and faith alone. There was set by faith and, and that's it. And there is no works. And they were, the Judaizers had come in, they were arguing with him back then, way long ago. They were arguing with him and they remember what they were trying to say, that salvation was by, by works. Well, Paul went to Jerusalem, we've already been there, and he dealt with that. But now Paul's been gone for a while, and the Judaizers have come back into the church, infiltrated into the church again, and what are they doing this time? They're telling the church that if you want to stay saved, if you're a Christian, then you should be a Jew. You know, you've got to become a Jew, you've got to follow the law because you're a Christian. 
And Paul is writing back to the church and he's saying, no, that is not it. And in chapters 3 and 4, remember what Paul's doing in chapters 3 and 4. It's one illustration or one argument after another about how salvation is by faith and faith alone. That's been all of chapters 3 and 4. And today in chapter 4, the illustration gets pretty personal. Because today's illustration is not an Old Testament illustration. It's not somebody, some story out of the Bible that Paul's using some story out of the scriptures. No, today's illustration is Paul talking about himself when he came to the church. When he came to the churches, I should say, when he came to that area, to Galatia, and he was in that area planting the churches, he's reminding them of what it was like when he first got there. And look what he says. He says, brethren, I urge you to become like me, not because I'm better than you. Look what he says. I urge you to become like me. Why? You say it. Because I became like you. Can you imagine the statement from Paul's side for a second? Paul was a Jew. Remember in the Roman world, in the ancient world, there was Jew and everyone else. There was Jew and Gentile. If you were Roman, you were Gentile. Greek, you're Gentile. Scythian, you're you're Gentile. Barbarian, you're Gentile. All of them were Gentiles. And it was against the Jewish law. We already read that in Galatians. Remember when we got there? It was against the Jewish law for the Jew to mingle with the Gentiles. And Paul is reminding them and saying, Hey, I'm urging you, brother, and I'm urging you to become like me because I became like you. When the Jewish law says, I shouldn't be around you, I came to you. When I knew it was going to hurt my testimony to my Jewish brethren, I came to you. When I knew my career as a Pharisee was probably... Out the window, I was willing to come to you. You see, I'm not urging you to become like me because I'm saying I'm better than you. Paul is saying I'm urging you to become like me. Remember that I came to you. Paul, the Jew of Jews, the Hebrew of Hebrews, he came to the churches of Galatia or to to the area of Galatia and he planted the churches there. He's saying, brethren, remember, I came to you. I want you to turn to a verse in the Bible with me. Turn over to 1 Corinthians and chapter 9 and verse 19. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 19. This is one of my favorite, and I want you to hear it because you you may not see it that way at first, but it is my favorite evangelical uh, passage. When I'm talking about when I, for myself personally, when I'm evangelizing or when I'm trying to train evangelizing, this is one of my go-to verses. I love this set of verses. It's 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 19. Do you have that? 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 19, and we'll read a little bit, so stick with me. For though I am free from all men... I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. To the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak, I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it with you. Did you catch that? Paul said, my favorite part there is, I become all things to all men that I might, that maybe there's this chance that just maybe I might win some. All right, you ready? I hope you all brought your still toes because I don't plan on pulling punches. Do you want to know why you're struggling to win people to Christ? Ooh, he's going to get serious, right? Do you want to know? I'm going to ask you a very serious question. I want you to answer this to yourself. When's the last time you won somebody to the Lord? When's the last time you had the opportunity to try? When's the last time that you set up and said, I'm going to try to work on making disciples? You know that we're supposed to be disciples making disciples, right? That's what the Bible says. We commit these things to faithful men who'll commit them to others. We're supposed to be disciples to making disciples. Are you making disciples? I'm asking a very direct question. And are you ready for this? You want to know why you might be struggling so hard? Because you're fighting for the wrong thing. You're fighting for, you're fighting to prove whatever, whatever thing you've got stuck in your head. I'm going to give you an example in a second. You're fighting for whatever thing you've got stuck in your head and you're forgetting that Paul said, I'll become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. There was a lady that I knew, a guy that I knew and this lady that I knew. And this lady was young. She just had a baby. And she posted her life on Facebook. 
I mean, if she had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you knew it because she posted it. it you know that person. You know who I'm talking about, right? I mean, if you wanted to know her day, just scroll through because every other post was hers. And this guy hated that. Both people, by the way, both people who I knew claimed that they knew the Lord. She was very backslidden. And she's posting everything, and this guy was behind her back. He was complaining and complaining about all her posting and all the things that she was doing. And so and one day, I'm, I'm just sitting back watching. I'm a people watcher. I'm just watching and paying attention. And, and this is what I noticed, that she would constantly say things like, Did you see my post? Did you see my post about fill in the blank? Did you see about my whatever? Did you see when I went to? Did you see my post? Did you see my post? Well, this guy decides to start smarting off to her. And what he would say is, no, I didn't, I didn't do that. I don't think you ought to be putting your whole life on, online like that. You don't, know who you're, you don't know who you're inviting into your house. You don't know. I mean, you're just posting everything. And he'd say these really smart aleck things. He would, he would he'd walk up to her one time. This is what he said to her. He walked up to her and he goes, Could I have some pictures of your kids? I want to I take some pictures of your kids and put them in my wallet. And she kind of looks at him real funny and she goes, You want pictures of my kids? And, and he goes, Yeah, I want to put pictures of your kids in my wallet. And when she looked real confused, he goes, That's what you're doing when you're posting it all on Facebook. You're trying to prove a point to her. I decided to take a different route, and the route I took was this. I followed her on Facebook. I friended her. By the way, the guy who was so angry, he jumped on me for it. He said, you're a married man. You shouldn't be friending a woman on Facebook. My wife has my password. I have her password. Y'all, if y'all don't know this, there's no secrets between us. If you're telling me something thinking I'm not talking to Sarah about it, you're wrong. We, we, talk, to, we talk about everything, and we know everything. I, I said, I'm not worried about that. I'm, my wife knows. So then I started doing something different. I would, I would come to church and I would see her. And I would say, I, I saw your post about fill in the blank. And she'd say, oh yeah, you saw that? And she'd talk to me about, about her post on Facebook. And I'd say, I saw, your, I saw when whatever happened, I saw, your, I saw your picture. That was a cool picture when you guys were down on the bridge. That was really neat. I promise you, not exaggerating one bit, that girl rededicated her life to the Lord. She brought her baby forward in church, and we dedicated her baby in, in church. We, we had a baby dedication with her, with her baby in church. And to this day, mind you, that girl, now granted, she still posts her whole life on Facebook, and I promise you half of what she posts are Bible verses that she's reading, things that she's struggling with. Do I like Facebook? Not really. It's not my favorite thing. If you talked to me 10 years ago, I hated it. If that guy, the grumpy guy, got his way, what was the best thing that happened? She got off of Facebook. Right? But instead, what did Paul tell us to do? I become all things to all men that by all means I might save some. Right? You see, we've lost it. We start majoring on the minor things. We start getting upset because this person's doing this thing that we don't like. I I really need to ask you a question. Is there maybe, just maybe, somebody that you ought to be sharing the gospel with, but you're too worried about how they're doing whatever. Right? Paul said to the church of Galatia, to the church of Galatia, I am asking you to become like me because I became like you. And by the way, that is exactly what Jesus Christ our Lord did for us. He didn't sit back on on his high throne and his is not. We have a high horse, but he has a high throne. And he didn't stay on his high throne and say, well, I'll wait for you to come to me. Instead, what did Christ do? Christ came to us. He who created the whole world, the most high God, became in the likeness of sinful man. Do you get it? You see what, do you see what, what Paul was being as a leader? He said, I came to you first. Don't you guys remember that I came to you and I'm urging you the same. You are Christians. I know most of you in the building. You are Christians. You believe in the Lord. We have an obligation to the Lord to lead people to Him. That's an amen point. Thank you. We have an obligation to lead people to the Lord. And when you get so busy fighting about their work ethic or whether or not they like the way that they drive or whether or not they post stuff on Facebook or here's a good one. How about all the adults that jump on kids for video games? I'm not a big video game fan either, but, you know, I can sit down and play a video game with a teenager if I think that maybe I can talk to him about the Lord. You'd be surprised the number of teenagers I've been able to witness to because I play the guitar. I don't even play that well. Doesn't matter. I said, <laughs> Sherry, thanks, Sherry. <laughs> but, but listen to what I'm telling you. I don't have to, I, it doesn't even have to be that I'm some rock star. It's the fact that I have the same interest that they have. You know, you can do that too. 
You, know, you, don't have to, you don't have to have all the same interest to, to set your sights on saying, I want to share the Lord with this person, and so I'm going to look for a, a way in. That's what Paul was doing. And look what he says next. I've got to get back to the text. I could probably stay there for a while, but look at verse 13 now. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Now, first of all, you need to understand the context of that. Did you understand what you just read? Paul says, you understand, you the churches of Galatia. Okay, guys, he's writing to them. He says, you all know this better than anybody. I preach to you because of an infirmity in the flesh that I had. Did you catch that? That's what he said. Look at it again. Read it with me. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. Now, I'll tell you, I think that Paul's physical infirmity was his eyes. If you look through the scriptures, all you see over and over is that Paul had trouble with his eyes. There's times that he couldn't write his own letter. He had to speak it and other people had to write it for him. One time he says, you can see that I wrote this because of the large letters that I had to use. He had to write in big letters so that he could, he could see. Paul, over and over, here again, in a moment, it, it, the people, he says, I know that you all loved me so much you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. I don't think that was an arbitrary statement. I think P Paul had problems with his eyes. But do you understand what he was saying? He said, because of that physical infirmity, I preached to you. That's one of two ways. Paul got to the churches of Galatia one of two ways. I don't know which one it was. I'm just telling you, in my mind, I see one of two. Here's how it could have went. Maybe, just maybe, Paul, there was some sort of a doctor or physician in Galatia, and Paul was going there to try to get treatment. And so the reason he was in Galatia was because he was trying to get treatment for his eyes. Or maybe... He could not travel. So option two is maybe he couldn't travel to where he wanted to travel. Remember in Romans, Paul said, I wanted to come to you. I've tried to come to you, but I've been hindered. The Lord's hindered me until now. Maybe Paul had his sight set on going somewhere else. Maybe he wanted to go to Rome, but he couldn't because his eyes, he was having trouble with his eyes and he couldn't make the trip. He didn't, maybe he didn't have somebody going with him who could guide him or stay with him the whole time. I don't know which one it was. Maybe seeking treatment. Maybe he was forced because he, he couldn't go because of his eyes. But whatever it is, in verse 13, you learn something about Paul. He was not planning on going to Galatia at first. He landed in Galatia because he couldn't go anywhere else. That makes a really good point for us. Stop looking for the place that you think you're supposed to be and start serving the Lord right where you are. You see, what happens is this. We get stuck on the idea of, I need to be here. I'm supposed to go to this place. I'm supposed to go. The Lord's calling me too, and we forget that the Lord's got you right here, right now. A lot of people ask me, they said, why did you plant a church in Crestwood? One of the answers to that question is, the Lord kept me here. We put out resumes. I got done with, with school. I put out resumes. No, I didn't have, nobody called. I mean, I could probably understand why. There's probably other reasons. <laughs> Anyways, so, <laughs> I mean, if they saw some of the sermon. Anyways, so, so I put out resumes. Nobody called. And then, the, and then the Lord kept dropping things in my lap, like pews. And, 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 and the Lord just, he just kept putting the same thing in, in my way over and over and over that I should plant a church. And finally, I, I just remember looking at Sarah. I said, it's going to sound crazy, but I really feel like the Lord's just telling us to stay right where we are. Listen, I'm not getting on missions. I love missions. Missions are great. We're going on a second mission trip for the year in, in two weeks. We're going on another mission trip. Sarah and I went to Honduras earlier this year, and now we're going on. We love missions. But don't forget that you have a mission field right here, right where you are. You say, I don't, here's the hardest one. Are you ready? I really hope you all listen to me. I don't want to be where I am. I don't like this. I don't want to be in this relationship or I don't want to be single or I don't want my kids to be fighting with me like this. I don't like the school system. I don't like this. I don't like that. But, you know, those are all tools from the devil to get you distracted on what the Lord wants you to do. Right now, today, I don't know where you'll be tomorrow. I don't know where you'll be next Sunday, but I know today you live here. And today you have a job here. And today you have family here. And today there are people that you could be witnessing for the Lord to. Paul took his opportunity. I don't know why he was stuck in Galatia. I don't know if it was a treatment or maybe he just couldn't make the trip. I don't know why. But he, for some reason, he couldn't go anywhere else. So what did he do with his time? He planted a church. Do you understand what Paul is doing there, the emphasis that he's putting on that? He said, I'm asking you to become like me because I became like you. When I was with you, what did I do? I took my time and I planted a church there with you and I told you about this Christ 
this Jesus. I expounded to you about Christ Jesus and, and all that he had done, how he died for you and how he rose for you. And Paul was reminding the churches of Galatia that when I was there with you, I preached to you. And look what he says when he says he, that he preached to them. In verse 14, he says, And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. Do you see the last part? Have I therefore become your enemy? Because I told you the truth. I can tell you this from, from firsthand experience. Most of the time, most of the time, people get mad at church and they get mad at their Sunday school teacher or their deacon or their pastor or whoever because they told them the truth. I'm right. It's a guy that I knew. He came to church for a long time. and He, would, uh, he had no problem bringing me. I, I felt like it was like an aim. He would bring me the most problematic, I mean, things that you would just say, there's no way somebody really thinks that. And somehow this guy would find them, and he'd go, I know just who you should talk to, and he would bring them to me. And then I would have the privilege of sitting down and talking with people about flat earth. You think I'm kidding, but I'm not. And I would have the privilege of sitting down and talking with people about whether or not God was a woman. Or I would have the privilege of sitting down and talking with somebody about whether or not God was the Father and the Holy Spirit was a mother. Or whatever else thing that he could find. And then somehow the Lord always blessed me. And I'd like think of some scripture and be like, wait, <laughs> there's one. I can at least think of one. Until one day. He came to church. I didn't know he was coming. I'm telling you, I didn't know he was coming, but it was, it was last June, and it was Pride Month. I didn't do it this June, but I did last June. I took on Pride Month. I'm not scared to talk about homosexuality being a sin. That's scriptural. And so that's what I did, unbeknownst to me that the person he had brought that day was a homosexual. And he was very upset with me. He was mad at me because he thought I planned it. I said, how would I know? You all think about that. How do I know if you're really going to show? If I write a sermon for you, that will be the week you don't come. I know, I, I'm right about that. I, have no, I cannot dictate whether you come or not. I wrote this sermon the week prior. I write my sermons on Monday. I wrote it on Monday. I had no idea who was coming the following Sunday. The Lord put it on me and I wrote it. And then when he brought the person in, did I know that they were homosexual? Well, it was kind of obvious. Did I pull any punches? Does he come to church anymore? He got mad at me. Did I change any of my stances? No. Our stances are the same. We stand on the word of God. And if the word says it, then that's what we believe. And we're not going to change that because the culture is changing. But what happens is, now let's speak of us personally. What do we do? We're great with the truth as long as it's not about me. Like right now in the room, I don't think there's any homosexuals in the room. So we're all great with that. Yeah, let's get on the homosexuals, pastor, yeah. Until your child's a homosexual and then you want us to accept it. And we have to say, no, we're not going to. I talk about fornication. Yeah, we're all about it. No fornication. Yeah, until it's you living in fornication. And then we have to say, no, you, you can't do that. And then all of a sudden, do you see what I'm saying? Like it's, 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 it's easy to sit back and say, yeah, to the truth when the truth isn't the thing that that affects you. And that's what Paul was dealing with with Galatia. There's this church, this church and Paul says, why are you upset with me? Why are you mad? At one point you would have plucked your eyes out for me and given me your own eyes. And now you're mad at me for what reason? Because I tell you the truth? And I want to tell you something else about the truth and you need to hear this because today we're talking for a moment about ourselves. If you truly love someone, you do tell them the truth. Penn Jillette, of all people, I'm talking about the magician with the like one finger painted red. The, I think he's probably a witch or something. He says he's atheist. He's Penn and Teller, the magician's Penn and Teller. Penn Jillette is the, guy's, he's a raging atheist. He'll admit it, but he says something very wise. He says, if you're a Christian and you truly believe that there's a heaven and there's this place called hell and that if I don't believe in your Jesus, that I'm going to go to that hell for all of eternity. He said, it is the most hateful thing you could ever do to not warn me. Is that not right? 
Friends, listen, if you really believe what you say that you believe, if Jesus is really the only way, if that way is so narrow and so straight, there's this big wide gate that says, come in all who you want, but there's a cliff and they just fall off it to destruction. And then there's this narrow way. It's not narrow in that it's, it's so that it's hard to find. It's not narrow so that, it's not narrow so that, you, so that God's hiding it from you. No, it's narrow because it's only one. It is one gate. It is one way. It is Christ Jesus. And if you really believe that Christ is the only way, then wouldn't you tell others that he is the only way? If you really loved him? If you really wanted to lead him to the Lord, wouldn't you tell him that? What if, it, what if it's going to break a relationship, though? What if, what if your kid's going to be mad at you now? What if, what if your friend's going to break off the friendship? What if your boyfriend's going to break up with you or your girlfriend's going to break up with you? And again, I think, I think on one hand, there, there's the easy street of saying, yeah, well, yeah, we, we know the church answer, but, but when it's you, when it's you and when it's you personally and when it's your kid or your nephew or your friend or your neighbor, that's when it becomes really hard. But I'm challenging you with this. If you really love them, you'll tell them. Because if you really love them, you can't stand the thought that they don't know the Jesus that you know. Paul said, why are you angry with me? Because I would tell you the truth. And that's what you have to hang on to. Even if someone's going to get angry with you. Do you know this? I want you to think of it from a different perspective for just a second. Do you know that Paul gets absolutely nothing if the church of, churches of Galatia grow? Think about that. Paul planted these churches. He had moved on, was planting other churches. If the churches grew, did Paul get something out of that? Did, were they, were they going to fund him in some way? Paul got nothing from this. What did, it, what did he receive? Well, he had already received, he'd already received uh, treasures that aren't here on earth, treasures in heaven. How did he receive those? Because people got saved and baptized? No, because he did his part of sharing the truth. Whether they accepted or didn't accept, his, his reward didn't change. You do know that, right? Whether some, whether you tell, if you tell somebody about Christ, whether they accept or don't accept doesn't change your reward. Your reward is from telling. You did what you were supposed to do. Look at what Paul says next. He says this, he says, are you mad at me in verse 16? Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Now look at what, he's just going to lay him out. They zealously court you, but for no good. That's the Judaizers he's talking about. These, these guys trying to get him to follow the law. He says, these guys are coming in trying to get you all to follow the law. They zealously court you, but for no good. They want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. They want, you, they want you to focus on them. They want you, as long as they're getting something out of it, they wanted, the, the, the Jews wanted to come in and say, you need to follow the Jewish way. You need to follow our way, what we know is best. And Paul is reminding them and saying, can you not see what is happening right in front of you? These people zealously court you so that you'll follow them. What is the difference between what Paul had done? Did Paul not say earlier in verse 12, did he not say, I urge you to become like me? What's the difference in Paul saying, but you become like me because I became like you? And pointing out in verse 17 that they zealously court you because they want you to be excluded for them. You ready for this? Paul didn't want them to be zealous for himself, Paul. Paul wanted them to be zealous for the Lord. You see, they wanted, they wanted the Jews wanted for, for the churches... Whatever churches they were, they wanted the churches to follow the Jewish way. They wanted them to follow the law. They wanted them to become like the Jews, like they were, because they were God's chosen people. And Paul was saying, no, I don't want you to become like me for the sake of becoming like me. What Paul meant was, I want you to become like me because I'm telling you about Christ. What did Paul say? Remember what Paul said uh, to the Corinthians? Remember what he was saying? Some say that they're of Apollos and some say they're of this guy and of that guy, but, but aren't we all of Christ? That's what he's trying to point out to them. He's saying, look, they want you, but they want you for the wrong thing. They want you to be zealous. They want you to be excited for them. But what's he go on to say? Look at it in verse 20. Uh, I'm sorry, in verse 18. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always and not only when I am present with you. You get that, right? Paul is saying, I want you to be zealous for Christ whether I'm there or not. Whether, whether Paul gets any glory out of it or not, whether anybody knows that he was there, whether anybody knows that he planted the church, no matter what, Paul says, I don't care whether I'm there or not there. I want you to be zealous for a good thing always. Not just when I'm present with you. Not just when I'm getting something out of it. Not just when, not just when I'm getting the blessing out of it. But because I just care for you. 
Here's the mark of a good leader. And by the way, let's talk about us again and, and our ministry. We ought to care for people simply because we care for them. There was an old guy who came to our church one time. Came one time. I, I got to tell you this just because it's hilarious. I promise you this true story. He calls me up and he says, ver, I, I pick up the, the phone and, and he says, first words, didn't greet, greet me or anything. He said, what version of the Bible do you use? I said, well, I, I like the New King James Version. It's a personal favorite of mine, but we'll use, and before I could say anything else, click. Okay, <laughs> whatever. So I went on and a few weeks goes by and this old guy comes in the church, real old guy. He comes in the church, hobbles in, sits in the pew, listens to the whole sermon. I got him, I greeted him afterwards. I shook his hand. I said, we were glad, I'm glad you were here today. It was, it was nice to meet you. And uh, He said, I got to tell you, Pastor, you've put me in a real predicament. I said, okay. He goes, I called you the other week and asked what version of the Bible you used, and I hung up on you. I, I kind of thought that might be you when I heard your voice. And... Uh, he said, you put me in a real predicament. He said, I really like your sermons, but I'm King James only, and I'm not coming back. I don't, I don't know what you want me to say. Like, I mean, I'm not King James only. I'm not going to be. Like, I'm sorry. I know some of you guys are, but I'm not. I'm not, gonna, I'm not falling for that. So he says, I'm King James only. And, and so, okay, you know. I said, could I come out and talk with you about King James, like how it was formed, and would you be willing to at least hear me? I said, I've got a 1611. If I could bring you 1611 and show you, would you, be, would you be willing to listen to that? I promise you this is a true story. The, the 1611 King James has a different typeset. And so F's look like S's in the reverse. And so I turned open to John. I was sitting in his house. I turned open to John. And I said, could you just read that for me? And he said, the laughed fupper. <laughs> and I said, do I need to say much more about the King James has also been translated? <laughs> That's a true story. He told me, he said, I'm, he said, I'm not going to come to your church. Okay, all right, I, I can't win you. A week later, somebody told me, I won't use his name. They said, did you hear about Mr. So-and-so? His, his basement flooded, his sump pump quit working, and his basement flooded. And me and a guy named Ryan put on our shorts and flip-flops and went over to his house, and we started bailing water out of his basement. And he came down with a couple glasses of water for us, and he gave them to us, and he said, I'm glad you helped me, but I'm still not coming. And I told him, I'm telling you, this is a true story. I looked at him and I said this. I said, you know, we weren't trying to get you to come to church. You're just an old man who needed help getting the water out of your basement. Sometimes it's okay to help somebody without the motive of I'm, I'm trying to get them to come to church. Or I'm trying to get them to do the thing. Maybe it's good to just help somebody just because you want to help them. Maybe it's good to care for them just because you care for them. Right? Is that, am I not telling the right thing? That's what Paul was saying. I want you to be zealous for a good thing. They're zealous for you because they just want you to follow what they want. I, I care for you. I was zealous for you, and I'm still zealous for you, and I want you to be zealous for the Lord whether I'm there or not there. And I just want to read this last little portion right here. Read what he says in verse uh, 19. He says, My little children for whom I labor and birth again until Christ is formed in you. I would like to be present with you and change my tone for I have doubts about you. That verse struck me the hardest. I'm, I'm studying on Monday and, and this is what I thought because remember where we started today? Remember we started, I told you about my pastor and when he sniffed at me and what was my first reaction? I'm not going back. And isn't that kind of our reaction? Isn't that what we do? Somebody wrongs us, and what do we say? I mean, we, we pull a Steve Urkel. I don't have to take this. I'm going home. Right? We, we get angry, and the first reaction when we get angry is to leave. The first reaction that we, that we typically have, and if you don't believe me, just look at all the churches around, and you see what I'm seeing. Churches have split and split and split and split because they didn't agree with each other. And so here's Paul and the whole church has turned their back on him. Multiple churches, it's churches of Galatia, not one church, but multiple churches have, have turned on him and they've made him out to be the enemy. And what did Paul just say? I wish I could come back to you. If, if I could. The, do you read it again? Just right there in verse 19. My little children from whom I labor and birth again until Christ is formed in you. Verse 20. I would like to be present with you. 
wow, even if, he, even if they wronged him, he wanted to go back to them. And I, I say the same to us. If you, really want, if you really want to win somebody to Christ, if you really want to disciple somebody, that even means when they wrong you. What did Christ say? If somebody steals your shirt you, or somebody steals your jacket, you should give them your shirt. If somebody slaps you in one cheek, what should you do? Turn the other cheek. See, our reaction, our typical reaction is to, is to run from them, get away from them. Well, forget them. I don't need that. I got these other churches. Paul could have went to any of the other churches. He could have went to the church of Philippi. They loved him there. I don't need to go back to Galatia, but what did Paul say? When he heard that they were struggling, what did he say? He said, I, I wish that I could come and be with you again. And one more thing as we, as we close out, is that not also what Christ has done for us? You do know that when you mess up and you, and you sin and you hinder the spirit, that Christ has the same reaction. You do realize that what Christ wants from you is that you would repent, that you'd confess your sins and that you'd repent. And what will he do every time? If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness. As a matter of fact, he loves you so much that here's the truth. Even though you've been saved and you know the truth and you still have sin and you still struggle, just like Paul said he wanted to come again, Jesus is going to come again. Christ wants you to be with him so intimately and so closely that you do know that's a physical. One day you will be in his physical presence. One day for those of us who believe, not because I'm so good, not because I'm so righteous, but because of his righteousness in me and his righteousness in those who believe, one day we will be with him for all of eternity. That is what Christ wants from you. You want to talk about the best leader that you could ever have. Look to Christ who says, even when we injure him, even when we've harmed him, even on the cross that day, what did he say? Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. God wants you to have a relationship with him. And we would be, we would be making a mistake to close without telling you the, the only way that you can have a relationship with him, which is what Paul has been trying to tell the Galatian church, churches over and over that you can have a relationship with Christ by faith in Him. No other way. You can't follow the Jewish law. You can't join the church. You can't go get in the, in, in, in the baptistry and get baptized. You can't go to great prayer meetings on a Friday night. All those things might be wonderful things that, that are part of being a Christian. But for you to be saved, and for you to stay saved forever and forever. Don't misrepresent that. I didn't say you got to get saved and then get baptized to stay saved. No. For you to be saved in the Lord Jesus and have a relationship with him, it's one way and one way only, by faith in him. Put your faith in him who came to this earth and died for you and rose for you, and he saves you for all of eternity, and nothing can separate you from that. All right, let's close in prayer.